In October 2008, Jim Stangle shocked the marketing world by leaving his prestigious role as global marketing officer at Procter & Gamble, one of the most admired brand building companies in the world. The bold move was Jim's first step on a new mission to share his passion for growing business through a focus on, high, on higher deal, ideals. Continu continu to continue on his mission, Jim has embraced a variety of exciting roles. President, CEO of the Jim Stengel Company, Limited Liability, author of Grow, Ideals, uh, Grow How Ideals Power Grows, and Profit at the World's Greatest Companies, and Unleashing the Innovators, How Mature Companies Find New Life, with startups, speaker with the Washington Speakers Bureau, and advisor to several companies. Thanks to the Crown Publishing Group for their support to this, this talk. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Jim Stengel. It's so good to be among this group. I've been in and out of the meetings all day, and I came in last night. My first job out of college, when I was 22 years old, studying liberal arts in the United States, was in book publishing. And I joined a really hot company then. We were having trouble keeping up with the demand, hiring enough people, and the company was Time, Inc., and the division I was in was Time Life Books. Does anyone remember them? So, so I was working on book series. I did about six of them a year. And I started as a proofreader, and then went into picture research, and then photo editing, and then I was a picture editor. And it was a fabulous job. You know what my starting salary was? I hear this industry doesn't pay that well still. Any guesses on my starting salary? Yeah, that's good, pretty good. $7,600. And it was late 70s in Washington, DC. So it couldn't go very far, so I didn't buy a car. Had a bike and public transit, and I worked at the Washington Star at night doing sports reporting just to supplement my income. So I started in publishing, and I worked there for four years, and, um, and had a blast. Now, frankly, some of my best friends to this day are still from that year. Tyler Matheson, the famous business reporter at CNBC, he was with me as a young guy. Peter Kaufman, who went on to be a great editor at the Washington Post and New York Times, still a really, really close colleague. So anyway, so that's, uh, so it's good to be back, good to be talking to book people about books. Uh, my career has taken a few twists and turns since then, which we can uh, talk about. So who was here for Sadia this morning? Anyone? What was the coolest slide she shared? Anyone remember it? Toward the end of her presentation? She said, she said, less fear, remember that? And more what? Kindness, Kindness. what else? Curiosity, what else? Harmony, generosity. So that's a really good slide. And we're going to talk about those themes in the next half hour or so. So Sadia was a wonderful setup for how we're going to end the day. And I thought hard about what I could talk about that would be relevant for this group. Because you have there's a great mix of people in this room, of course. So I thought, I just did this book. It was a fun book to write. It was a blast to research. And I thought, I'll talk a bit about what I learned in that book that would help you no matter what your job is. So sort of, and that's why I titled this sort of, you know, finding new life in your organization. Because my guess is most of you, except the woman who has the bookstore and works herself, works by herself, most of you are in an organization. And most of you probably have issues in that organization. I've never met one that didn't. So we're going to talk a little bit about the lessons I've learned in my career and through this book in finding new life in your organization. So those are our objectives. Very lofty for Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock before wine, but we'll do what we can to accomplish some of these objectives and give you maybe something to take back home and apply in your business or your life. And this is our agenda. It's Friday afternoon. We're going to do a quiz. Sorry about that. No prizes. We're going to do a quiz. You're going to have a two-minute speed date with me. Noah gave a nice introduction, professional introduction. I want you to show a little bit more of who I am as a person. It's hard, in my experience, to trust someone if you don't kind of know where they're coming from. So then a bit about why I wrote my book, six lessons, what it means for you as a leader. And I guarantee we can do this in 35 minutes, 3440. So, so anyway, the first quiz. So I did a big book on startups and big companies. What percentage of startups fail? Anyone? 95, 85. This is a global number, by the way. 95, 85. Anyone else? 97. 97. You're sort of in the right ballpark. It's surprising. <laughs> I mean, a lot less than I expected. And this means those who return the money that was invested in them. So it's not a terribly high bar. 
So it's not as drastic as people think. What percentage of Fortune 500 companies are still on the list versus the year I was born? And I wasn't born in the 80s. Anyone? 5%? Anyone else? 8? You're in the right ballpark. You're very good. 12. What was the life expectancy of a Fortune 500 company 50 years ago? Any guesses? Projected life expectancy of a Fortune 500 company 50 years ago. Anyone? 100. One more? It's an auction? 50. Pretty close. 75. Right down the middle. What's the life expectancy of a Fortune 500 company today projected? What was that, 20? 10? 15, you're all good. You're smart. You're smart. This is a good one. What's the probability of a company? How old is Amazon? What, 20? I come from a company, Procter & Gamble, who is how many years old? Anyone know? 181 years old. What's the probability of a company lasting 100 years today? Where's the chart guy, Noah? Have no idea. 45 in a million. This is from the book Scale that was released around Christmas time. Anyone read that by a theoretical physicist? Giant book. Have you ever read it? It's about scale and nature, scale and companies, scale and countries. Great book. Very dense. Very hard. You'll be smarter if you read it, but this came from that, that book. He also gave the probability of a company hitting 200 years old. Guess what that is? One in a billion. So I worked at a company whose odds of making it to 200 years is one in a billion, and it's still around. So there's interesting lessons, I think, there. So, and this is the last one. How many Fortune 500 companies declined in revenue last year? How many? Number. A little harder. 350. 350? Anyone else? Half. Yeah, close. Yep. About half. So, what's changed? These are really dramatic numbers versus 50 years ago. So what's changed? You tell me. Anyone, shout it out. Internet. Internet. What else? What else has changed? Global trade. Global trade. Anything else? The way people communicate. The way people, yeah, the way people communicate. What else? What was that again? Yeah, yeah. All these things, all these things. So I think the big question, and one reason I'll talk about in a minute why I wrote the book, is this trend reversible? You know, do big companies have a shot? By the way, they're big employers, they do lots of innovation. I do think it's important for the world that they sustain themselves. But maybe more important, what are we learning from companies trying to reverse that? And that's what we're going to unpack a little bit today. But first, I promise you a speed date, and we'll do it here on Friday afternoon. You'll get two minutes, I promise. I'll stay under two minutes. This is about you, not me. But this is part, some of my team and their partners. Good things happen you, when you have a spirit like this. A big thing for a leader to do is to create spirit in a team that is positive. Positive as well as challenging. So this is kind of the spirit we try to create every day. I grew up in this house in a town called Lancaster, Pennsylvania, southeastern Pennsylvania, about 60 miles west of Philadelphia. I was one of six children, Roman Catholic family, Roman Catholic school for 12 years. I wanted to be a writer when I was a kid. I read Willie Morris's North Toward Home, and I was blown away. All I wanted to do was work in writing and publishing. But then I, I love sports, too, so I did a lot of sports growing up. And the nice thing about being CMO of P&G, there were some bad things about it. You got to meet people like this. So this was when we signed those three athletes, most of you probably know who they are, to work for Gillette when we purchased Gillette. So and Roger Federer, by the way, is everything he's cracked up to be. <laughs> he is the sweetest, kindest, most intelligent, most caring human being. Great dad, great husband, great athlete, great human being. I can't wait to see what he does post-tennis. 
He's a, he's a remarkable person. Went to these two schools, married this amazing woman. I'm still very much in love, 34 years. We had these two babies. Claire, the girl, was, has been a crazy avid reader for her entire life. Our son just got engaged over Christmas, this bride's girlfriend. I worked at P&G in five cities, four countries, over 25 years. I worked in all sorts of businesses in the last seven years. I was the head of marketing for the company. This is my team now. We're 12. We're all friends. 12 women, two guys. It works really well. We do a lot of education, human development programs with these sorts of organizations. These are some of the people we work with day in and day out. And I like to write. I still like to write. And I just did my second book this fall and, uh, and frankly miss the process. It's, you know this, it's fun to work on a book. It's nerve wracking, it's crazy, but it keeps you curious. It keeps you learning. So that's a speed date. So you okay? We good so far? You know the stretch or anything? No? All right, super. So a little bit about why I wrote the book I just wrote, Unleashing the Innovators. And by the way, the title came from a person. It came from an interview, which we'll talk about in a minute. The idea sort of was kicking around in my head for at least 10 years. And this is a Wall Street Journal headline from the front page of the Wall Street Journal about 10 years ago. And that's my sketch. Doesn't look too much like me anymore. And that's Tim Armstrong, who at the time was a senior person at Google and is now the head of Oath, which is the Verizon company that's the combination of AOL and Yahoo. Anyway, he was head of sales for Google, and I was head of marketing for P&G. And Google was a startup. And they had this thing called Search. And we're talking in the mid-2000, you know, this was 2004, 2005. And Tim invited me out to meet the founders. And I went out and said, wow, I don't know where this is going to go, but it's going to have an implication on our business. So I said, um, we need to get to know you better. And so we knocked around how we might be able to do that. So what we ended up doing is I sent brand managers from our biggest brands, like Tide, like, like Pampers, like Always, like Bounty, like Charmin, like Pantene, we sent them to Google, not for a weekend or a day or a visit, for a month. And they had to work with the search teams, with the engineers. They had to understand what's going on here and what's going on in the culture. And then Google people came to Cincinnati, to corporate headquarters for Procter & Gamble, and worked on the brands. So they understood what it's like to be a brand person on some of these brands. So. And then after that month, they got together, they wrote down what they learned and what the impact should be on the company at large, both Google and Procter and & Gamble. And this created a tremendous amount of energy. So the Wall Street Journal heard about it and said, holy cow, can we write about this? And they came in and we said, sure. So they interviewed the people who did this and they ended up putting this on the front page and doing a major story on this. So I thought at that time, wow. This is, this is fun, this is interesting. Why aren't more people doing this? So this idea of this old established company and this startup coming together and thinking about their relationship in a deeper way than a transaction and learning what they can learn, or finding out what they can learn from each other to scale across their enterprise. So then I left Procter & Gamble about when that article came out, actually. I left after 25 years because I wanted more freedom I wanted to do my own thing. I wanted to pr pursue my passion. I wanted to work 100% of my time on what I loved. And that's sometimes hard to do in a big company when you're in a big job. So I started this little company and I met all these other companies and everyone seemed to be working with startups. Everybody. So I said, what's going on here? I didn't have a thesis for the book. I had this thing with Google kicking around and everyone was working with startups. Everyone seemed to be doing it differently. So I said, there might, there's, there's got to be something in here that's interesting. So I began a quest. And I like research. I like the chart guy. So I began qualitative. So I traveled to visit about 50 companies in about 15 cities. And I went just, I followed 
like a journalist does, the leads. And I, went, and I just went in and it's like, what's going on? Who are you working with? How are you working? And I visited startups and big companies. And then I commissioned a global study with Ogilvy Red, which is a great research consultancy. And we looked at 201 firms, about half startups, half big companies, global in scope across these industries. So that was the data that went into the book. And the thesis that sort of emerged, and I partnered with someone else on this, and it was helpful we did it actually, because it was a big project. What emerged and what the, the, um, the approach we took to the book was to sort of write a playbook for someone in a big company who wants to use partnerships to revive their culture. So that's kind of what emerged as a thesis. That's, those are the stories. And we wanted to populate it with interesting stories that were inspiring and full of lessons. So what I want to do is share with you six lessons that I think are broadly interesting for whatever your job is in the room and tell a few stories around each one. And the first one is, my Lord, be distinctive. Be differentiated. Every one of these startups was searching for that. And many of them could not articulate how they are distinctive. And the big companies I work with, if they can't articulate and show you how they're trying to be a differentiated employer and have a differentiated way to go to the market and market and sell whatever they have, they're in trouble. I do workshops with media agencies. I do about two of these a year with the next generation CEOs of the media agencies of Publicis, Omnicom, WPP, all the big communication firms. And this is what we work on. Because they all sound alike. And when you sound like your competition, you go down and you compete on price. So what are the lessons in being distinctive and different? And obviously, I talked to this company in the research who is, I would say, despite their scale, what are they, the second? Who works for Amazon in the room? Anyone? No Amazon people, OK. But anyway. They're 20 some years old, they're the second most valuable company in the world, and they behave like a startup. And you know this, you know them as well as I do. But this is what's important in that company. They're extremely clear in what's important. They're, they overtly say they want to be the most customer-centric company in the world, bar none. More customer-centric than Procter & Gamble than anyone else. Success isn't really the financial numbers, it's customer feedback. While they're a totally quant company, anecdotes trump the data. They like customer comments, customer problems in their own words. They like to solve those. And they put a lot of focus on the day one culture. Everyone should behave like day one. And how they work. These are their words. We like to allow builders to build. I was talking to one of their senior financial people, and I said, how do you manage this company? How many pilots do you have? So I have no idea. Thousands. Anyone in this company can start a pilot. They don't do it with a lot of money, but they have the license, the liberty, the freedom to fail and to try something. And they believe innovation cannot be managed. You create a culture for innovation and you let people go. No team can be bigger than two pizzas can feed them. At Procter & Gamble, we had teams where I don't think 10 pieces could feed them. You know, it's a good principle. And this is a crazy one. It's from one of the senior financial people. Anyone can stop a product if they don't think it's right for the customer. Anyone can pull the plug. And their rituals, which we don't have to go into in great, great companies, great cultures have rituals. And there is they write a press release about a new product, what they want it to be, how they want it to be written about. They don't, they don't put together keynotes or PowerPoints. They put together narratives. They tell stories when there's a new idea that they need to scale or they want to scale. They bring in people to raise the bar after a decision's been made and challenge it. And every department has in front of them every day the top 15 complaints. And that forms their work, and that forms their agenda. 
And this has resulted in, I would argue, one of the most differentiated, distinctive organizations, brands in the world. So anyway, second lesson, um, and this was kind of the heart of the book. Those companies that really use their partnerships, not just to find a technology, or not just to find an entrepreneur, or not just to find a platform, to actually shift their culture were the ones that, were, that really stood out and were successful. And there's some data that came from the quant study. Here's a company that's going through massive change. A lot of, and people are very negative on this company right now. And the stock is way down. And I actually have been in there a lot. They open their doors. They have about 100 startups they're working with. So I had tremendous access to them. And I actually have a lot of confidence they're going to figure this out. So um, they've done a lot of work with Eric Ries, famous author, as you know, the lean startup. They brought him in not just to have a meeting, make a speech. They brought him in for a couple of years to help them change all their processes in the company to be faster, more agile, more entrepreneurial, less fearful. Third lesson, and this I guess we could apply in a lot of our lives, you know, the, the companies that were success, most successful in partnering didn't put the legacy company leader in charge, they put the startup in charge. And that may be counterintuitive. You partner, if you're GE or you're Shire or you're IBM or you're Toyota and you're partnering, put the startup in charge of the operation. And this is a company you may, may or may not know. They're, they're, um, they're based in Dublin. They have a big research center in Zurich. Their headquarters in North America is in Boston. They're trying to solve the intractable rare diseases of the world. So they're working on stuff where they have 100 or 200 or 1,000 patients. So it's a remarkable purpose, a remarkably smart company. The CEO is a Danish pediatrician. So he has a big empathy muscle. And he's trying to make the company ever more caring. He personally, he personally goes out and meets startups, meets entrepreneurs, meets emerging technologists. And when they partner, he personally supervises that. He considers it his work. And he puts them in charge. He doesn't move them to their headquarters. If they acquire them, he lets them still run on their own. And if they need help, Shire gives it to them. But they have this amazing network of startups in rare disease that they let run. And they are, they are just responsive to their needs and if they need anything, resources, distribution, technology. And sees it as his job to do that. And lesson four, this is so simple, so obvious, but it doesn't happen enough. And that's to keep an outsider mentality in everything we do. Here are three CEOs who are part of my book. Uh, Ginny is with IBM. The guy in the middle is Target. Obviously, used to be up here. It's pulled back. And the other guy is the head of to Toyota Connected, which is their data science unit of Toyota, to helping try to bring artificial intelligence to mobility. They all somehow are able to keep their perspective. They don't get sucked into the politics, the internal drama. They keep their outsider perspective way up here. Sometimes they come in from the outside, like Brian Cornell did at Target, but these other two were our career Ginny Romani has been at IBM for like 30 years. When I was at Procter & Gamble, I try to do this now as a habit. I try to get out of my comfort zone and visit organizations that are really different. So when I was at Procter & Gamble, I went out to see Nike. I went out to see Facebook when they were young, Google, which we talked about. I go to places like South by Southwest where you bump around and just re meet really different people from you, ask them different questions. So I just help, think it's a basic human practice, get out of your industry, get out of your comfort zone, do something to keep yourself creative, keep yourself fresh, and ask them their perspective on some of the things that you're wrestling with. So I still do. I went to South by Southwest last week. I don't have a real hard agenda there. I just sort of am curious and bump around. Go to, go to discussions that I, I don't think I'll understand and see what I can wean from that. Just think it helps to keep your helicopter up, and keep you curious. This one for big companies is, is I think, just remarkable. 
fail like a venture capitalist. What's a venture capitalist do? They make lots of small bets and they assume their failure rate is going to be high. What happens in most large organizations in their engineering or their R&D group? They make bigger bets and they count on a lot of them working. So I think, and there's a startup called Bionic. This is a guy named David Kidder. He's a serial entrepreneur, very successful entrepreneur. And he's formed a company to help large organizations shift their R&D. So rather than placing a few big bets and then executing, he helps them behave like a venture capitalist. So if you're running R&D, let's say Procter & Gamble, and you might have 100 major projects in your pipeline, he's saying you need 500. And expect 400, 450 of them to flame out. And feed them a little bit of resources as you get more and more learning from customers, from consumers. So this is a startup that is really trying to change how large organizations even think about their jobs and their R&D and their engineering. Then the last lesson, and I don't know, this is so, um, in so many large organizations, they've lost sight of this. You know, fall back in love with the customers, get to know them, get out of your office, and the product or service you're selling, and if you're not in love with it, if you're not passionate about it, if you don't believe in it, then change that. Or leave. If you can't change it, leave. Most large organizations have lost sight of this. Startups are pure on this, the good ones. All they want to do is make stuff that has an impact that is important. They don't care about their title. They don't care about their cash, largely. They do care about the future of the company, of course. But they're in it because they believe in it. And this was palpable. I went to, this is a silly picture. This is from Pinterest. We visited Pinterest. And Ben Silverman, the founder, I said to him, what's your greatest fear of this company that's growing like crazy? And he said to me, disappointing anyone. I don't want anyone that's associated with our business, or our brand, to be disappointed. And he said, and uh, all I want to do is build products that make people happy and help them with their interests. So, um, so anyway, six very simple lessons that I weaned from the book research that I thought might be helpful for you to think about, have some dialogue around. And the last point I'll make before we open up and we have a few minutes Courage came up in every interview. I visited 50 companies. This came up in the first 10 minutes of every interview. And you heard Sadia talk about it this morning when she started. There is so much fear in organizations of, 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 of making a mistake, of missing the promotion, of stubbing your toe, of looking bad in a meeting. And we just have to work on that. We just have to, what, what's the worst that can happen? We need more courage. We need more boldness. We need more freedom. We need more innovation, often an overused word. So we need more courage. So, uh, and that's how I closed out my book. It's a bit of a rallying cry for everything. That, if, you, if you went through me, if you stayed with me through the book, I just implore everyone, work on this one and break it down. What does courage mean for you as a leader in your job day in and day out? This is Zach Hicks, who runs Toyota Connected, their data science group. I was interviewing him, and he said this to me. We let the outside in, and that helped unleash our innovators in-house. And it was like, got my title. Got my title. Came right out of, out of one of the people we interviewed, who was a, who's, who's a remarkable innovator, actually. So that's where we started 40 minutes ago. I hope we made a little progress against one or two of those for you. And I now want to open it up. I know we're, we're getting very close in the wines out there, but is there anything anyone wants to chat about, ask questions about? It's been a long day. It's okay if you don't. We've got the bouncy cube if you want it. But anything else? Yes, ma'am. Bouncy cube. Um, I I have a question about building those partnerships because yep. there's often this sense of opposition yeah. where these companies or even these modes of work are 
in competition with each other and you can't share with the startup because the startup's coming to take your market share or you can't really rely on the legacy companies or the larger companies because those larger companies are doing the old way that you yep. never want to yep. do and replicate and they represent everything that you want to disrupt. So what, how do you even start that partnership process to say you have something of value that I can learn from and let's exchange? Yeah, uh, it, it's, a, it's a big question. Sorry. And uh, you know, we, but what I found that nearly every company I went to that was successful at this, there was a tremendous amount of trust and there was somebody accountable in that company for the relationships with the startups. So the startups had air cover. There's someone who was a barrier buster and it was on the startup side. And that's what distinguished the ones that were having really success, successful partnerships. But at the end of the day, it wasn't about the contracts, the finances, the numbers. It was common purpose and trust. And if those were there on both sides and they had tough talks, then it worked.